The following video deals with the sensitive topics of race and violence. Viewer discretion is advised. Candyman, 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 Candyman. As stated in the 1992 film, No one ever got past four. As saying his name a fifth time would summon a vengeful, hook-wielding serial murderer. Though possibly just an urban legend, the real-life connections of Candyman are in many cases far more horrifying than a scary movie. In the film, a graduate student investigates the urban legend of the Candyman, a ghostly figure that haunts the Chicago housing projects and murders to keep his legend alive. Summoned most famously by those who dare speak his name five times into a mirror, he appears with his trademark trench coat, often accompanied by bees, and brandishing a hook for a hand. The 1992 film launched the Candyman legend into the zeitgeist, though the character and the story are adaptations from Clive Barker's earlier short story, The Forbidden. And the Candyman's connection to the real world lies in some key differences between the short story and the movie. While the plot of both is similar, The Forbidden is set in London, and the Candyman is described as a white man with yellowish skin. This plays into one of the larger differences, as the film's entire plot is about the ghost of a black man who haunts the Chicago housing projects of Cabrini Green. In the short story, the Candyman is given no particularly detailed backstory, but in the film, he's given a rich and horrifying history. In the film, he's described as the ghost of a gifted black painter from the late 1800s who was once hired to paint a portrait of a young white woman. They fell in love and she became pregnant. Her wealthy father became enraged and the painter was brutally killed by a group of white men who cut off his hand, replacing it with a rusty hook and covering him in honey and bees, resulting in him being stung to death. Once dead, they burned his body and scattered his ashes at the site of what was now the Cabrini Green housing projects. As disturbing as it is, this new backstory would highlight and parallel real-world atrocities that befell many black men in America's disgraceful history. The term miscegenation, meaning the blending of races originated from Lincoln's opponents in the midst of the American Civil War. For the next century at least, fear surrounding interracial relationships and marriages, as well as social equality in general, came up in nearly every political, economic, and social rights debate. Post-Civil War white supremacists used the fear and opposition to miscegenation as a cornerstone of their system of beliefs. Between 1882 in 1968, at least 3,446 black men were lynched, publicly and ritualistically murdered by white mobs. Many of these terrible lynchings emerged out of irrational white fears about miscegenation. Roughly a third of the men who were murdered were accused of raping white women. Largely, these accusations were used to justify lynch mobs' actions to a larger white American public. Ida B. Wells, a black journalist, demonstrated that many of these rape accusations were actually stemming from consensual relationships between white women and black men who were found out by the woman's disapproving white relatives. White fear of interracial relationships would last for several decades more, and while bans on interracial marriage would slowly be repealed, bans would exist in Delaware until 1986, Mississippi until 1987, and South Carolina and Alabama would keep theirs until 1998 and 2000, even then only narrowly passing the repeals. But the film doesn't stop highlighting racial injustice with the Candyman backstory. In setting the story in Chicago, and specifically Cabrini Green, the filmmakers consciously make a choice to focus on the inequality between wealth and poverty, and whiteness and blackness. Though they no longer stand today, the Cabrini Green homes were constructed in the 1950s and 60s as part of a public housing project 
intended to provide lower-income families with affordable housing. However, the Cabrini Green projects became nationally known not for success in public housing, but for violence, crime, and extremely poor living conditions. In the film, the main character, Helen, focuses on one particular murder in which a woman in the homes was being attacked and called the police. Pleading for help, she tells the police someone is coming through her mirror, thinking she's crazy or perhaps not caring. The police never come. She's found brutally murdered. Many people think it's the Candyman, as of course, he's summoned through the mirror. But Helen investigates and finds that the apartments, being so cheaply made, only separated by a thin medicine cabinet wall, at the bathroom mirror, allowing easy access to another apartment, if someone wished to enter. While filmmakers don't reference a real-life inspiration for this story, in 2014, an article in the Chicago Reader drew a parallel between this piece in the movie and the real-life murder of Ruthie McCoy. Ruthie McCoy was a resident at the ABLA apartment complex. McCoy suffered from extreme paranoia, and according to the Chicago Reader, the building itself and its location did little to help calm her. According to McCoy's relatives, signs of mental illness became apparent in McCoy when she was in her early 20s, though the exact nature of her illness was unknown. In April 1987, Ruthie McCoy called 911 at a quarter to nine in the evening, saying, I'm a resident at 1440 West 13th Street, and some people next door are totally tearing this down, you know. Another call came into the police concerning McCoy's apartment at 9.02 that evening from a woman saying she had heard gunshots coming from the apartment. Around 10 minutes after 9, four officers arrived on the scene at McCoy's apartment. They called for McCoy, but there was no answer. With no way to enter the apartment, the police decided not to break the door down and instead left the scene at 9.48 p.m. The next evening, a woman named Deborah Lassie, who was neighbors with McCoy, called the police. Lassie told the police that McCoy would normally stop by her apartment on the way out every morning, but hadn't stopped by all day. Some police, accompanied by a few security guards, visited the home again. Once again, they knocked, but got no answer. Police were discouraged by the security officers from breaking down the door. One saying the tenant could possibly sue if a police officer broke in. And once again, the police left without answers. A day later, Lassie told the project office that she was concerned about her neighbor. A project official arrived at McCoy's apartment around 1 p.m. with a carpenter who drilled through the door's lock. Inside, they found McCoy in her bedroom. She was lying on her side in a pool of blood. She had been shot four times. According to the story determined by detectives, McCoy's assailants removed the cabinet in the apartment next to McCoy's, broke through McCoy's cabinets, and climbed through the wall into her apartment. The Chicago Reader article's author, journalist Steve Bagheera, is the one who suggested that the McCoy murder inspired the 1992 Candyman movie, though this claim has not been confirmed by the writer-director, Bernard Rose. However, the parallel is hard to ignore especially when you consider the fact that the real-life event happened to a Ruthie McCoy while in the film, the victim's name was Ruthie Jean and the neighbor's character is named Anne Marie McCoy. On the whole, the film is also an exploration into urban legends, how they enter our consciousness and how they persist as modern folklore. The tale of the Candyman is perceived as an urban legend co-opted by ruling gangs of Cabrini Green to commit crimes and instill fear into those that live in and step near the houses. The Candyman himself states that he must commit these acts of violence, shedding innocent blood, to continue to exist. Because without the stories, I am nothing. The film also references urban legends like the alligators in the sewers tale, among others. This is no doubt, in keeping with Clive Barker's original themes, 
While there isn't much information about the origin of the hook hand trope in folklore and scary stories, it's been used in storytelling, especially as a descriptor for villains. One particularly popular tale involving this trope is that of the hook man, which was very popular among teens around 1959 and continued to be throughout the 1960s. The legend says that the hook man kills innocent people, mostly young couples, who are out at night. Additionally, it's been interpreted many times since, such as in the 1997 horror movie, I Know What You Did Last Summer, and in Alvin Schwartz's scary stories to tell in the dark. The theme of urban legends is continued in the Candyman's ability to be summoned simply by saying his name into a mirror. This is, of course, more famously utilized in the case of Bloody Mary, which has many different origins and can be found in folklore in many different countries. Similarly, the ritual is performed by saying Bloody Mary's name into the mirror several times, which is supposed to result in seeing a face in the mirror. Folklorist Janet Langlois postulates that the significant utilization of a mirror in the ritual reinforces the social valuation of women through appearance. Therefore, the mirror may also already be considered a source of anxiety for many women, especially young girls on the verge of puberty, which many people believe is the purpose of horror films, as well as urban legends in general, to shine a light and even prey on the underlying fears we already may have, and often, as a result, comment on the society in which they are born. Of course, the forbidden is born from this, and Candyman is both aware of this and expertly continues this tradition. Giving the film a favorable review at the time, film critic Roger Ebert profoundly states that urban legends tap our deepest fears, and one of the most subterranean involves the call for help that is laughed at or ignored. As Steve Bagheera observed in his article for the Chicago Reader, Ebert may not have realized that, in the projects, it was hardly a deep fear that the calls for help would be neglected. It was simply expected. With a new, anxiously awaited Candyman film on the way in August 2021, it becomes all too clear that the inequity and disparity told of in the original 1992 Candyman was not an issue of the past then, and 30 years later, is not the past now. Hey everybody, my name is James Troop and I just voiced the Candyman video that you just watched. I hope you guys love learning about the origins of your favorite scary movie characters. And if you have any scary movie characters that you want us to dive deeper into, let me know. I'll see what we can do about that. Thanks for watching guys and I'll catch you on the next one.